got us. Yeah. I almost got here. You're great. Good for Thank you, sir. Did you get my message today? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just wait for everybody to come down. I do appreciate you all coming. This is a special press conference. I don't think the entire time I've been speaker have we ever had a bicameral press conference. But today we are because it is a special occasion and it is a special issue. Because 105 days ago today, I finally had gotten a meeting with the president in the Oval Office. On February 1st, I sat with the president and I said, we should work on the debt ceiling. The last thing I'd want to have happen, Mr. President, that we'd be in the last week in trying to negotiate a debt ceiling. Let's sit down in a sensible, responsible way. Because our debt has gotten too large, Mr. President. Even as Senator, you voted no on many of these debt ceilings because you said you were upset that there wasn't enough savings. I've watched far back in the 2010, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs, when our debt was only 14 trillion, told the American public the greatest threat to America was not China, was not Russia, it was our debt. It has more than doubled. Our debt is larger than our economy by more than 20%. If we do nothing, we will pay more in interest in the next 10 years than we paid in the last 83. If we do nothing and you follow along, and God forbid you get a Biden default, because he ignores the problem just as ignored the border. Said Mr. President, could we start our meetings? For 104 days, he said no. All the Democrats lined up and said, no, we just need to raise it. Because they added $6 trillion, we had inflation harming every single family. They attacked the energy of America. We saw the price even go higher. We saw we became more dependent upon China, a supply chain challenge in America. Every week I would ask, could we just sit down? But he said no. The difference was Republicans in the House and the Senate got together to listen to the American public. And we said we would make sure that we don't have a Biden default. So we raised the debt ceiling. But in doing so, we did it in a limit, save, and grow. Limit the future ability of Congresses to just spend wildly and stop the inflation. So we said, let's start with spending where we spent just five months ago and grow e each year by 1%. Let's save the hardworking taxpayers' money in this waste and money that you have appropriated that hasn't been spent like COVID that has sat there for two years. We finally got the president to sign a bill that the pandemic is over. And you know what else? Let's grow our economy so we're not dependent upon China. Let's help people get lifted out of poverty into jobs with work requirements, something the president as a senator voted for and President Clinton signed into law. Let's make sure we could build things in America again. Let's cut the red tape. Let's get some permitting reform that we know we can make America stronger and less dependent upon China. But well, we passed that bill. Had we not passed that bill, the meeting never would have taken place. Yesterday was a change. Yesterday, united with the Republicans in the House and the Republicans in the Senate who stood up and said they would no longer go along with the idea that you would just raise a debt limit borrow money for China to provide to people not to work. United together, we are standing with the American people. This is exactly what every household does in America, every business and every state capital has to do. A debt ceiling is the equivalent of your child having a credit card. And for the last 21 years, this child has spent all the money up to the limit and all you have done 
is raise the debt ceiling. Well, now it's become a real problem because you owe more on the card than you make all year and another 20%. So is it wrong? Is it not reasonable? Before you lift it, you're responsible for paying what was spent. But should you first look at how you're spending your money? That's exactly what we're doing with Limit, Save, Grow. Now the president and Leader Schumer have finally backed off their idea that they won't negotiate. They finally backed off the insane, unrational, unsensible idea that you just raise the debt ceiling. The president has selected two individuals, OMB and Rochetti, to sit down with us, but our timeline is short. This is what I wanted to avoid 105 days ago. And when the Republicans in the House lifted the debt ceiling, Secretary Yellen had never told us the deadline was June 1st. We wanted to act ahead of time. And we do that issue after issue. Just like the President avoided the border with Title 42, the House Republicans did not. We actually passed the bill to secure our border. We continue to listen to the American public. And I will tell you as Speaker, we have a group of Republicans in the Senate that have listened to the American people as well. Senator from Wyoming, Senator Barrasso has helped lead the charge with Mitch McConnell, with Thune and all the others, and Senator Lee, who put a letter together. I remember when he talked to me, could he get the enough signatures? I was worried for one moment. Could we get enough signatures? <laughs> He called me back, I think, in an hour and said, I've got more than enough, and I've got people who didn't sign it that will, that will still vote that way because they're listening to the American public. And I can't tell you enough of how thankful I am of you being so responsible with the idea. Am I optimistic? I'm optimistic for America because the people standing behind me. I'm optimistic of our ability to work together. Do we have obstacles? Yes, we have a big obstacle in the White House. But we're going to change the course of history because we're going to stand for the American public. And let me introduce the senator and the chair over in the Senate Republicans, John Brassel. Well, thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your leadership. The President of the United States is playing Russian roulette with the American economy. For month after month after month, the President refused, refused to meet with the Speaker of the House to talk about debt and spending. Why? Does the President believe that there is no wasteful spending in Washington? Does the President believe that in a $6 trillion budget that nothing could be, could be cut? Billions and billions of dollars has been set aside for COVID. Is that all off limits? The President said the pandemic is behind us. What about tying welfare to work. The American people that I listen to overwhelmingly support that. Is the president that out of touch? Republicans in the House of Representatives have actually passed legislation. It is serious. It is responsible. It raises the debt ceiling and at the same time cuts wasteful Washington spending. Republicans in the Senate stand in firm support of the Republicans in the House of Representatives. Meanwhile, the President of the United States has spent the last three months pandering to the liberal left. The President is playing a very dangerous game with our economy. It is time for Joe Biden to stop this debt ceiling madness. And now, Chair Elise Stefanik. Thank you, Chair Barrasso. I apologize. I'm losing my voice. We've been so focused on communicating uh, this important issue to the American people. It's an honor to be here today with both our House and Senate Republican colleagues to highlight our joint commitment to a solution that would responsibly raise the debt ceiling, strengthen our economy, and address our nation's debt crisis. For over 100 days, Joe Biden and House and Senate Democrats have refused to offer a sensible solution to our nation's debt crisis. Crisis. Their only plan, which is no plan at all, is to ignore this fiscal crisis and do nothing to limit spending, save taxpayer dollars, or grow the economy. 
Democrats have put our economy at tremendous risk. Republicans remain the only ones who have taken action to avoid a default on our debt. It's long past time for Joe Biden and Democrats to do the same. But today, with only 15 days until the June 1st deadline, Joe Biden is jetting off to Asia. Whether it's the border crisis, the energy crisis, or this debt crisis, Joe Biden continues to run away, pass the buck from each crisis that his policies have created. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of my good friends and our colleagues in our uh, partner chamber, Senator Mike Lee, who has been such a tremendous leader in unifying the Senate Republicans in support of our Limit Save Grow Act. Senator Mike Lee. Thank you, Chair Stefanik. Senate Republicans stand united behind Speaker McCarthy and the House Republicans. We all understand the gravity of the situation. We need to address the debt ceiling, and we need to do so in a way that makes a difference, to make sure that we're not back here in just a few more months, with spending having caused more inflation and ballooned our federal debt even more. So to that end, 45 Senate Republicans have acknowledged that they will not, they've committed that we won't support cloture, we won't support bringing debate to a close on any debt ceiling increase that does not contain substantive spending and budgetary reforms. Now, it just so happens the House of Representatives has passed precisely such a bill. We stand behind that bill. We need to pull up and pass that bill. We need to do it today. Look, the Senate has no business leaving town before an agreement has been reached. Let's get this done. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Representative Dusty Johnson from the great state of South Dakota. Mr. President, for 97 days you refused to negotiate with the Speaker. For 97 days you underestimated the unity and the resolve of this conference. For 97 days you assumed that ignoring this problem would make it go away. Now, we can't get back the squandered 97 days, but more concerning, sir, is the fact that you don't appear particularly committed to using the 13 days that we have left. Mr. President, cancel your trip to Japan. Stay at the table. Acknowledge the resolve of this team on these stairs and accept the fact that we must change how this town spends money. Inaction and intransigence will not wipe away $32 trillion in debt. Good grief, Mr. President. When is enough enough? Shame on anyone, on anyone who refuses to act. Speaker McCarthy and this entire team have been responsible, reasonable, and sensible. Time is short, Mr. President. Let's get this done. With that, I would, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, a great legend from West Virginia, <laughs> Chair <laughs> Shelley Moore Capito. Yeah. I should just sit down now that I'm a legend, but uh, <laughs> that goes against everything we do, right? Uh, it's great to be here with uh, my House colleagues and my Senate colleagues. Uh, and I want to say, first of all, uh, the gauntlet that uh, that Senator Schumer threw out to Speaker McCarthy when he said you can't have a plan, you won't get it done. Well, guess what? <laughs> they got it done. And they have the only plan that we see that raises our debt limit, but also responsibly brings in fiscal sanity. Plain and simple, the president who prides himself on being such a great negotiator has refused to negotiate for 97 days. And so here we are on the brink of a Biden default. And I, I, I think we saw the helicopters going across here. And I said, I think he's leaving now to go to <laughs> go to Japan. I'm like, stop, stop. You know, we have an obligation here. Uh, we have an obligation to the people that we represent. We have an obligation to, uh, to ourselves as legislators, responsive legislators, to do the right thing. And the right thing was to get into the room and as Dusty said, you can't go back and find those 97 days again. 
But it's time now for the president to get serious, to have, have fiscal responsibility, fiscal sanity. And I can tell you, I know it's hard to rein in the cats on the House side. It's really hard to rein in the Republican cats on the Senate side. And we are united behind our House colleagues. They did a magnificent job of showing strength, of showing a plan, of showing a common sense, plain and simple way to answer the great, great challenge uh, of the fiscal situation that we find ourselves in. So uh, I, I'm, I have full confidence that uh, the negotiators in the room are going to be able to, uh, to work this out with, with the speaker leading the way. And I've heard uh, Leader McConnell say more than a few times, this is not an unusual exercise to negotiate the debt limit, to have fiscal um, responsibility as a part of that. We've done it many times in the past, and we have to do it this time again. And I would like to introduce uh, Representative Chip Roy from the great state of Texas. So, so this is what the west side of the Capitol looks like. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you to the senators who came over. After months of saying he would not, President Biden now has done what we all knew he would do. Sit down and negotiate with Speaker McCarthy and the representatives of the people. This is not surprising because Americans saw Republicans pass a common sense, responsible fiscal path forward for America and realized that the only person talking about default is President Biden. Now the president says we must trade away all but perhaps the most basic of reforms that we passed in the bill. But throughout his posturing, the president has failed to realize the most fundamental and important truth, that the core of this debate is not whether the federal government will default on its debt, it won't, but whether we will continue to allow this nation to default on the American dream. The truth is the dream is out of reach for too many Americans, and the biggest obstacle is the very government entrusted to protect it. So we gather here today on a bicameral basis to send a message to the president. This legislation is purposeful, not political. We stand for the hardworking American family unable to afford groceries, gas, housing, or health care because of inflation fueled by trillions of dollars in reckless spending. The plumber that never took out a student loan but is now being forced to pay for his neighbor's master's degree or the veteran paying for a liberal arts major to get the same student loan benefits he earned by risking his life for his country. The nurse who wants to save lives without a federal bureaucrat saying she has to take a needle. The blue collar workers watching their way of life sacrificed to the altar of climate fetish while billions of tax dollars of corporate tax credits go to crony subsidies in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. The rancher in Texas putting diesel in his truck but forced to subsidize a tech worker making six figures to buy a Tesla hundreds of miles away. Minority and poor taxpayers trying to make ends meet that an expanded IRS audits three to five times more than other Americans. We're standing up for the Americans who simply want their country back. And all they ask is that we stop recklessly spending money we do not have, racking up debt, weakening the dollar, driving up inflation, all to fund the very bureaucracy weaponized against their way of life, as we saw yesterday unfold regarding the FBI. We passed the Limit, Save, Grow Act to do just that, to shrink Washington and grow America. We did our job. Now it's time for the president to do his. Mr. Speaker. Well done, sir. I'm so honored with the people behind me. You know, the president, 105 days ago when I sat with him, said he wouldn't negotiate. America's too great to have such a small, petty idea as that. Americans believe you should talk. We wanted to talk the entire time. But when he refused to take action, we did take action. We took action for the American public. You know, I watched Elise come up here and talk. Her throat's a little sore. She's been talking a lot, but she's a new mom. It's her first Mother's Day. I don't know if you've ever met Sam, happiest guy you've ever seen. But you know what? When Sam was born, he was handed a bill for $94,000. $94,000 to every new child born in America. That's the legacy that's being left. But we decided enough is enough. We actually want to have them, give them a future, give them an opportunity, give them the ability to go further than the generation before them. And this is the moment in time to make that stand. 
The only question is whether we have a Biden default or not, it's the president himself. We passed something reasonable and sensible. All we say is let's spend what we were spending five months ago. Let's save and the money that we have appropriated that hasn't been spent for two months, let's bring it back to the hardworking taxpayer. Let's put some caps on what the future Congresses can spend. Let them spend more, but only grow by 1%. And let's unshackle what holds the greatness of this nation back to build. Let's cut the red tape to have that permitting reform. And you know what? Let's help those that need a challenge to take them from poverty to a job. We've known it works. We've seen it work before. Let's not settle for what we have today. Inflation, dependency on China, runaway spending. Let's know what America can be and let's achieve it. With that, let's take some questions. Yes, sir. looking at things like FMLA, they're still trying to put that on the table. Is that, is there still an avenue that Republicans would entertain those federal programs, or is that something that's completely off limits? Look, the way the founders created this government, which is so amazing, the House passes the bill, the Senate could pass the bill, and then we could go to conference. Unfortunately, the Senate under Schumer, the only thing I think they've passed, what I've noticed is March is maple, Maine maple syrup month. I don't know if they want that in the bill or not, but I would entertain that. <laughs> There's nothing to go to conference with a Democrat idea. And the sad part, when I sit with the Democrats, their ideas are old. You know what they think? We should just tax more. But anyone who would look at what's going on, if you look at the 50-year average of what is, comes in from the taxpayer of America, normally we bring in 17% of our GDP. Right now, we're bringing almost 20%. Do you know how many times in modern history that has ever happened that much? Only two times, in 1944 and 2000. But if you look at how much this government is spending, on a 50-year average, we usually spend 21% of GDP. He's at 23.6 going to 25. It is not a revenue problem. It is a spending problem. Amen. And any time you want to talk about, these are the people that are defending Social Security and Medicare. Because the Congressional Budget Office says if we go the course that President Biden wants us to go today, three trust funds go insolvent in the next 10 years. Never in the history of America have we ever seen a 10-year window like that. Social Security, Medicare, and the Highway Trust Fund. Do you know what happens then? They automatically get cut by more than 20 percent. Mr. President, stop hiding. Stop traveling somewhere else. America wants an American president focused on American problems, finding American solutions. We have them here for you. Yes, ma'am. Look, I, I go in the room as well and my staff and um, the president has put two people in there. If there's certain topics come in, I'll have certain other members come in and talk as well. The difficult part here is the timeline. <coughs> we didn't act based upon what Yellen said, because she said this was months later. We acted because we never wanted to be here. This is the worst way to govern. And I hope the American people see that the Republicans in the House do not ignore problems. The Republicans in the Senate want to take it up, but Schumer won't allow it. <coughs> we take action and find solutions, and that's the way we want to govern. Yes, ma'am. Look, he's the president of the United States. He's a grown man. He can make a decision where he wants to go, and he could travel any place he wants. The only thing I know, if you thought for the last 97 days you were never going to negotiate, what are your priorities? I think America wants us to solve American problems first. He could decide whatever he wants to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't think it's going anywhere for one. <laughs> Secondly, you're sitting here with senators who have 45 who sign it's not going to do it. So is that even sensible? 
Is that even being productive? Is that even reasonable? Is that responsible? It seems to me that would be playing into a Biden default. I think America public is tired of those political games. You know, when we devised our bill, it wasn't a bunch of Republicans saying, let's just give these Republican ideas. When we talk about work requirements, Senator Biden voted for that. President Clinton signed it into law. We watched every study after the fact take people from poverty and provide a job for them. So we saw Americans lifted up. We saw welfare rolls drop. We saw more people have houses, more people could afford to send their kids to college. We saw the positive of that. When we thought about, what about limiting the growth of government in the future years? We didn't say we had to cut every year. We saw a Democrat Senator Manchin propose a 1% growth each year. We tried to grab things that both sides, even if they wouldn't talk to us, let's put something together to make sure it's reasonable. I will tell you, if it was Chip Roy and Dusty and I sitting in a room and we were going to draft something that we said just we want, it would have looked different. But we wanted to be reasonable and sensible. Do we, does the American public think it's wrong if we simply saying, let's spend what we spent five months ago? But every moment I've spent with the president, he doesn't want to go there. He does not want to go back one dollar. I literally ask him, what, what is finally the number? Is it $40 trillion in debt? How much before you say, let's stop borrowing from China and not looking at places that we're wasting our money in? Every household does that, and we should do it too. Yes, sir. Well, I've watched um, Congressman Graves. He, he's been elected to, or appointed to our leadership table, and he's worked with all the different groups, and he's really been the individual that helped bring people together in crafting the bill itself of Limit, Save, Grow. So he has a clear understanding of where members are. So when you're sitting in that room, I didn't want to put somebody in that room who didn't have a time. He is a former staffer. He's a former um, member working in government. He understands policy. Many people would call him a policy wonk. But at the same time, my staff is in there with them as well. So we want as many voices and many understandings of where the bill went and what we would like to see for a conclusion. Yeah, we, we, talk, we talk very frequently. I go in the room as well. So I, I think if the, if the administration can make decisions with the president out there, we'll be okay. Yes, sir. Look, what happens now is, you know, with Schumer and the president saying all along, I won't negotiate the debt ceiling, they have to be separate, you don't have the time to play those political games anymore. Um, it takes so many days to get through the Senate, so many days through the House. We have a 72-hour rule, which I'm not going to break. I think the American public and all the members should have 72 hours to read what we end up with, if we're able to end up with it. Um, I think the House should go first, and we can send it to the Senate. I know that uh, the Senate, I guess, is out of session, but I'm sure they'll come back. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't understand anything that has consequences. This is a senator who voted for work requirements. Um, listen, I think when you're sitting in the room and you're listening to the American public, why wouldn't he want to help people get out of poverty? But listen to really what he's saying. So the decision he's making in his mind is, if he doesn't want to have something that has consequences, he wants to borrow more money from China to pay an able-bodied person who has no dependents, not even to look for a job, not even go to school for 20 hours. So you're going to ask little Sam to make that $94,000 higher because we're going to borrow from China for a person who could go get a job to not help him get one. So what you're going to have is a supply chain that doesn't work as well, more dependency on China, and making America in a weaker position. I think that's wrong. So I wish he was here, then we could debate it even more. Yes, sir. Oh, you already asked one. Are you open to considering a tax 
it's increased one to one. No. No. Did, did you listen? Were you here earlier? <laughs> no, I'm not being I'm not being a jerk. But did, have you read the CBO numbers or anything? Okay, so on a 50-year average, we normally bring in 17% of GDP. We're bringing in 20%. You know how many times in history we've done that? Twice. 1944 and 2000. So if we're bringing in normally 17, we're bringing in 20, that means we're bringing in more money at any time in American history. But what we're spending, for the last 21 years, we spent more money than we brought in. But instead of only spending 21% of GDP like we normally did for the last 50 years, when the Democrats came in, they spent $6 trillion. Now, I don't know if you're an e economic major or whatever, but if, but, but if you study Morton Freeman, he would tell you the only place that inflation is created is government. So that $6 trillion brought us inflation. So what did that do? Your money goes less. You have less money to spend. It doesn't go as far. We've had, of our four biggest bank failures in America, we had three of them in the last couple of months. Why? Because interest rates went up. Because the only way you curve inflation is you make interest rates higher than the inflation rate. So what does that do? That harms people from buying houses. That means you're paying more on your credit card. But that means every taxpayer is paying more because of our debt. So we're going to pay more on interest. But he went all the way up to 23%. So we're spending more than we spent in 50 years, but we're bringing in more than we've been in 50 years. So I go back to your question. Having that knowledge now, would you raise that question again? Yeah, yeah but would that be a way to no. some of the provisions? No, it's very clear. You know what I told the president 105 days ago when I sat in the Oval Office? I have no preconceived notion of what we have to do in the debt ceiling except two things. We're not going to raise taxes, and we're not going to pass a clean debt ceiling. But we have to spend less than we spent the last year. So let's sit down and talk about that. But he decided, no, I shouldn't negotiate with somebody. I'm just going to do what I want to do, my way or the highway. That's not the way our government is designed to work. It's not the way business works. It's not the way your household works. And it's not going to work here either. Yes, ma'am. Look, I, I don't know on a scale. I'm not going to scale you. But I'll tell you this. Earlier in the week, all the way through this, I just want to be honest with the American public. I went to Wall Street more than a month ago to warn them, we're not meeting. It's a problem. I went to you day in and day out, and you made fun of me. You're saying, oh, you just want to have a meeting. No, I didn't want to be here at this moment at this time. Then we passed our own bill. We never would have had a meeting had we not raised the debt ceiling ourselves. We put an idea of how to do it. The only thing I'm more optimistic about, he finally agreed to something that every other time we've been able to solve a problem has worked. The structure of negotiations. But now we're along such a short timeline, it makes it almost harder. But if there's one thing you know from me, I never give up. I have the grit, the perseverance, and we're going to get it done. Thank you all very much.